my name is Nell. I'm originally from Northern Ireland. Um, I keep an apartment in Belgium, which is a pleasure. And it's a pleasure to give a talk here in Ghent. One of my passions, my great passions, is machine intelligence. And in the past couple of years, we've seen a vast abundance in the power and capabilities of machine intelligence. For decades, we've had computers that look at the world in uh, very rigid ways, right? Ones and zeros. And through the magic of something called artificial neural networks, we are creating machines that don't think in rigid ways, that are able to think in much more organic ways and to truly learn and understand the world around them. In essence, boil down, it works through something called gradients, which is a form of curves, and it's a form of curves and probability, and out of this mix, understanding and learning about the world can arise. And this is precisely how our own brains work. For example, about 60% of our brain is dedicated just to vision and nothing more. Uh, the sensory cortex and the visual cortex in the rear of the brain has six different layers of amazing neurons, and from this, we build up understanding about the world. Machines can now do the same. In fact, anything that can be done in about one second or so of human brain power, right, human cognition, can now be replicated by a machine. This is a sort of a, an intuitive intelligence or an intuitive understanding about the world. So what do human brains do in one second or so of processing power? Well, we might recognize a person, or we might transcribe between text and speech, or between languages, or we might make an aesthetic appreciation of something, right? Whether it's interesting or beautiful. If we string these one second moments together in loops, we can do things like pilot a vehicle, or we can make a prediction about where something is going to move next, right? Back in the 19th century, we built canals all across the world, and we crossed the oceans in great liners for the first time, and we harnessed the power of boiling water to drive steam turbines. And in the 20th century, we got electrical power into our homes and factories, and that enabled things like mass production, right? And of course, we used it for heating and lighting, but for a long time, we didn't understand that we could use it for other things like radios and televisions and electric razors. Today, in our time, we have access to a new utility. In fact, intuitive intelligence is now a utility that we can tap into at any time. And it is revolutionizing our world. There is not a single sector in our economy that isn't currently being revolutionized by these technologies. Everything from the world of law, to medicine, to construction, to farming, very old industries, many of them, are being transformed. And we live at a very interesting time, not just because of machine intelligence, but also because of the abundance of human intelligence we have today as well. 90% of all scientists who have ever lived in this world are alive today, right? And the amount of PhDs that are being granted annually is increasing exponentially. And if you think about it, even a very intelligent brain requires lots of experiences in order to be useful, right? And machines are getting lots of experiences because they have so much data now to rely upon that they can ingest and make sense out of the world, and human beings are the same. And this leads to a vast increase in the amounts of patents, for example, which is a, a rough yardstick of how many new inventions are being created in the world. And some of these inventions now are being created by machines. That's a process that's only going to increase further. So we're seeing a vast collision between an abundance of machine intelligence and human intelligence, right? Every human brain on this planet has 
86 billion powerful neurons. And often that's wasted in quite simple tasks, but when it's applied to something important, that one single group of 86 billion neurons can change the world. But are we prepared? The World Economic Forum reckons that of the children that are today entering school, 65% of those children, when they grow up, will work in a job that today doesn't exist. And perhaps we couldn't even begin to imagine that job, right? It'll be something we can hardly even imagine. There are today strange jobs whereby people actually train AIs in order to learn about the world or to understand about it. And these jobs couldn't have been imagined even five or ten years ago. It also means that our educational system is going to change. We're moving from the three R's, right? Reading, writing and arithmetic to something like the three C's, which are complex problem solving, critical thinking and collaboration skills. You know, the three R's aren't going to cut it anymore. You've got to have the three C's and to know them all very well if you hope to compete in the 21st century world job economy. It also means that aspirations are going to change a little bit. Today, a child might say, I want to be a doctor, right? And children are going to need to reframe this, as well as adults, into something more like, for example, I want to use empathy in a medical setting, right? Broadening the categories of what they would consider doing or how they would consider applying those skills. Because some of those aspects, say, of medicine might be completely transformed by machine intelligence. We're starting to see this in radiology, for example, right? Where machines can now very powerfully make predictions about uh, whether a lump is benign or uh, potentially troublesome. And machines are starting to be better than human beings at this. We're lucky, though, because we have amazing new opportunities to train young people as well. How many of you have heard of Scratch? Okay, quite a few. A good third or so. Excellent, glad to hear. I'm not sure if any of you are aware, though, that there are one million projects on Scratch created and uploaded and shared with other every single month. One million. It is a vast collaborative coding enterprise. And yes, it is a basic form of programming, but it is also a powerful and effective way of teaching children about more complex scripting languages. In fact, as an engineer myself, I really value th this kind of technology because I think it's a great way of teaching children a reverence for logic the power of collaboration, again, one of those C's, and also the rewards of being a maker. And being a maker is going to be a little bit different in the years to come than it has been in the years before. And one of the major reasons for that is mashups. Yeah? Where you take somebody else's content and you remix it, or you edit it, or you change it. And that's something that emotionally can be a little bit difficult at first, right? To welcome somebody else taking your creation and using it in ways that you didn't intend or that you didn't necessarily want. And it takes a bit of emotional maturity in order to be able to accept that or enjoy it or to declare something as being creative commons and uh, available for the taking and enjoyment of others. This is also a difficult thing within the world of education. Because typically, if you plagiarize something, if you uh, take somebody else's work and uh, say that it's your own, that's like essentially the greatest sin in the world of education, right? Other than outright cheating on an exam or something. So we're giving children a message about the work of others and how you should use it on one hand, and yet the world we live in is, is telling us something different. Getting children to work together, to remix each other's content, to share and share alike and reuse, 
is going to be a very powerful skill that we need to teach our children. And at the moment, we're not teaching it very well. However, there are wonderful opportunities, I think, to teach them about working with others. And those others may, in fact, be machines. As we all know, children have fantastic capabilities of fantasy and creativity, yeah? And they can often come up with ideas that uh, we could hardly imagine ourselves, right? And we're always charmed by this. But what if, instead of um, creating a, a very basic picture uh, that you might put up on the fridge, your child could translate their creativity and their fantasy into something much more rich and varied. We're now able to do that with technologies such as generative adversarial networks that can take a very simple sketch and give flesh to it, right? To create something um, very creative and full-featured out of very basic implements. We can do this with characters, we can do this with architecture, right? If you ask a child to, to draw a house, they'll do the little, you know, the, the, the windows with the crosses and a chimney with the smoke coming out of it. I don't know why, I haven't seen a chimney with smoke coming out of it in a while, but every child will do the same, yes? And yet they can create a building like this if they want, using computer-aided techniques. Or even style and fashion and all of these accessories, right? They can all be augmented by machines. Here's another example. On the left, we have a very basic sketch, something you might cook up in Microsoft Paint, even. And on the right, we have it rendered as one of the old master's paintings. And this can be done near instantly. And I'm sure many of you have done something similar with FaceApp, but maybe you didn't realize that these kinds of technologies can also be used on art. If you want Mona Lisa to grin at you, that's possible. So human beings are moving from being pure creators into being curators, right? The human being has changed its role into being that which decides what has meaning or what has value or what is worth preserving or worth sharing, yes? For example, in social media, I'm sure most of the stuff that we post some of it is original, but a lot of it is things that other people have said or done or created that we find noteworthy and worthy of sharing. These kinds of technologies can also create new worlds, amazing new worlds for children to explore. Here, for example, we have an old um, diagram of the city of Babylon out of a textbook. And a similar generative adversarial network process has remixed that with uh, Google Earth data to create first a map and then later a virtual satellite view of ancient Babylon, a city that, you know, died a very long time ago. With VR and AR, we can then take this away from the screen and bring children into this environment incredibly powerful new ways of exploring strange new worlds. And today, we happen to be on Zebra Strat, yes? And if you want, you can use these networks to turn a video of a horse into a zebra anytime you like. Can you imagine what it must be like to be a child today and to have these kinds of capabilities of shifting the world around you into more interesting forms anytime you like. Our children are going to be incredibly creative, I believe. These technologies can also provide insights into what you're looking at as well. This picture, when do you think that picture might have been taken? What year? Somewhere 50s, 60s? Okay. What about this picture on the right? Maybe that's a little easier. What, what kind of year do you think that was taken in? Oh, okay, I'm hearing a few things, 70s, 80s, early 70s, okay. Well, a machine intelligence 
system called Crononet, guessed that the picture on the left was taken in 1951 and that the picture on the right was taken in 1971. And that's basically within about a year of actual ground truth. So any time your child encounters an old picture or an old event and asks you, mommy, daddy, auntie, uncle, what is this? What are we looking at? And maybe you should kind of like shrug a little bit or you know, give some sort of plausible answer. Machines can now immediately fill in the gaps in terms of time, also in terms of geography. So we now have superhuman abilities to pinpoint where in the world a photograph was likely taken. And in fact, machines can now analyze photographs and create a very rich context about what is going on in that image, which provides all sorts of jumping off points for children to ask um, or dig into for more information. If you're anything like me, sometimes you might look something up on Wikipedia and then suddenly realize that about four hours have gone by and you've looked at about 30 articles, you know? I think machine intelligence can help our children to have similar wonderful explorations. And I think we're going somewhere that the world of science fiction has hinted at to us before. In Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age, there is this book within a book called A Young Lady's Primer. And in it, this impoverished girl learns about the world and receives an amazing education that otherwise she wouldn't have found and if she hadn't discovered this sort of smart AI-enabled iPad, if you will. I think today we are able to do something similar and in the near future we will have something broadly comparable in many ways. In the next few years, there are going to be between three to five billion new people online for the first time in history. And they're going to be interacting with us and with each other and sharing information, creating new stuff, mashing up new things, new fashions, new ideas. And there are wonderful projects that aim to accelerate this process. But it's not even necessarily needed. Because of the laws of accelerating returns, machines are becoming ever more powerful and ever more affordable. And it means that we can provide, if we wish, if we wish to enjoy it and partake of it, an amazing new form of education. One that is highly narrative, that is based upon stories, yes? Because stories are the way that we really understand the world, and I'll come to that in a little bit later as well. This kind of education, ideally, would be personalized. It would be one that is responsive to the individual needs, but also the individual talents of the person using it. It would evolve over time. It would grow in different ways as it understood that the capabilities of that student had increased and it would provide a direct form of education that sidesteps the existing um, infrastructure that we have for education today. I think that's a lofty goal and I think in time we're going to achieve all of these um, but it might take in some ways a little bit longer than expected. How many of you, when you were younger, didn't necessarily enjoy school all of the time? Quite a few. I think I was the same. Some people thrive in the structure that um, an educational environment can provide, and others don't, right? It's very dependent on personality for one. And in many ways, a lot of our educational infrastructure was created on the kind of the Prussian model, yes? And in many ways, we've moved on from this, but in some ways, we haven't. And what I find very interesting is that these 
three to five billion people coming online, most of them, or many of them, in fact, will never have been near a school in their life. The great educator Sagata Mitra talks about minimally invasive education, this idea of forms of education that are not so coercive, that are more, um, more open to negotiation, that invite rather than demand of the student, yes? There's a great book by senior TED fellow Robert Newworth called The Stealth of Nations. And in it, he talks about a class of people in our world called the Debouillard. And Debouillard or Debouardies is a kind of colonial French term that describes basically a hustler, somebody who, who doesn't have a set job, but they hustle and they trade and they do whatever they need to do to survive and often they do pretty well. In every country on the planet, there are debouillards of one form or another. And the funny thing is that today, roughly half of Earth's working population are of this class. They don't have a set job, yeah? They hustle for a living, one way or another. And in fact, the number of people on the planet proportionally that work in this way is increasing to two-thirds by the end of this decade. So there's going to be more people on this planet that don't have a job, that just do bits and pieces to survive, than those that do have a, straight, um, a, set, of, uh, a set of employment. And different cultures around the world have words for this. In India, there is the concept of yogad, or in China, the concept of gung-ho, right? Basically, getting the job done any way you can, using your smarts and your initiative. We have something similar in the West, and in fact, it can be described as hacker culture. And in essence, that is what Debuyardis is. It is a form of hacker culture. And hacker culture and hackers' mindset is something that is truly precious, believe it or not. Companies like Google tell us today they look for people that are great at lots of things, that love big challenges and welcome big changes. People who are flexible, people who constantly learn new stuff and aren't afraid to get their hands dirty. The problem is that often in our current educational system, those people that do like to get their hands dirty, that do like to you know, just pick up stuff and learn as they go, are often told to stop, to not do that, to sit in your structured environment as do, and do as you're told, because that is convenient. And often the way that our educational infrastructure is set up, that kind of needs to happen. If those children aren't in the right structure, then maybe their unique skills and talents aren't appreciated by the system. But this is an important thing to me. Because in many ways, I myself was one of those children, and I'm sure there's some of you also in this room that didn't quite fit in the standard model of things and kind of fell out of the system and had to figure out our way slowly to get back into it. And I think a lot of the greatest talent in the world often ends up wasted or ends up being used for purposes that are less than noble. And that's why I think it's so important that we have things like makers' fairs, right? Where people that do have this kinds of hands-on way of learning and experiencing the world can exercise that talent. And I also think that machines can help within the class environment to make things more tolerable for these children that perhaps have a little bit less of, uh, less of attention with, with dealing with things that are a little bit dull or with sitting still and doing what they're told. There's something called short interval scheduling and it actually comes out of the agile development framework, but I think it can be applied just as easily to education. And it's basically, rather than having um, children work in blocks of 
you know, a couple of hours and then switching to something else, that they are constantly given new goals or new things that they can try, right? This is just Google Goals, which is a calendar plugin for Google Calendar. But it's a similar kind of way of making suggestions about what you should do next, right? Maybe you haven't been to the gym in a week and it can start to make these kinds of suggestions, right? You've got a big math test coming up. Maybe you want to spend the next half hour revising. If we can give children some autonomy in making the decisions of how they spend their time reasonably, then maybe they will be start, um, much more engaged in how they spend their time within the educational environment. And we can also use machine intelligence to help make things more bearable for the teachers as well. Heaven knows it isn't always fun to do grading and marking and that sort of thing. But it's important, right? And it's important for a couple of reasons, but one of the main ones is to know, is our children learning? And it's very important to be able to pinpoint when children aren't able to follow something. They've lost the plot and maybe they ask their peers and the peers can't really help them. And we need to know when to intervene. Machines can help with this process. In the past few years also, we've seen MOOCs, of course, create new ways of accessing education, whether it's in school or whether it's at home. And I think these are very useful tools, but in some ways they're not actually that revolutionary. In essence, it's still one person addressing a bunch of people, even if it might be 100,000 people in theory. The, 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 the general model of one person talking and other people listening hasn't really changed. So it solves the problem of access, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of engagement. And I think that's why there's such a huge drop-off from people working with MOOCs. Something I find fascinating is the flipped classroom model. This idea of students learning in their own time, but then coming together every so often in order to meet with their peers, swap notes, collaborate in group projects. It's an interesting model, and I think organizations such as Minerva are doing something very similar as well, very interesting. Minerva's model basically has students live for six months or a year in a certain location, and then move to another one, and then another one, and gain a lot of experience in different cultures over time. And this kind of intercultural competence, learning how to work with people from very different backgrounds, is going to be ever more important in our incredibly globalized world of the 21st century. It's possible, in fact, that when you have students that move around, from place to place, a lot of their classmates may have come from very different locations or may have not even um, been to their home continent, but through the mixture of VR and AR, they can all come together in a sort of virtual cyber homeschool. The question then is, can we make these kinds of things more personalized in order to increase engagement? Famously, Alexander the Great had, of course, Aristotle as his personal teacher and mentor. And there are questions about whether something like that can be done with AI. I think yes and I think no at the same time. I think one of the biggest challenges of being a teacher is to understand why a child made a certain decision or to get inside the mindset of a child, yes? There are many different ways of being wrong, and it's very important to understand correctly why someone was wrong in order to advise them and to help them. And that's something that I think machines are going to find incredibly challenging. Something else is the difference between a coach and a mentor. A coach is there to help you improve your score numerically in one way or other, right? Something that you can um, quantitatively describe, right? The speed of how fast you can run or how far you can throw something. 
Mentorship, however, is very different. It's much more long-term. It's much more qualitative. And it's something that even can go both ways sometimes, right? I think that machines are going to find it very difficult to mentor human beings in any way that teachers can. And so I think for this reason, the role of the teacher is certainly not going to go away anytime soon. Furthermore, I think the role of the teacher is going to be more holistic, in fact. The great educator John Taylor Gatter says that the primary goal of education is not to teach facts, but is instead to deliver students two truths that will enable them to take responsibility for their lives. The most important thing you can do as an educator is not just to teach facts and figures, but is to teach character, the values that construct a person and that enable them to make healthy decisions about the world today and for the rest of their lives. Right? You're not just teaching a subject, you're building a whole person. And in fact, these kinds of soft skills of character, things like a growth mindset, or collaborational skills and persistence, these are the skills that really matter today and tomorrow. And it is these skills that are really going to set children apart in the years to come. The CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, says that common sense and empathy are going to be some of the most scarce resources in the world of education and employment. And today, companies like SAP, Facebook and Johnson & Johnson are all setting up empathy labs, right? In order to help inculcate a culture of empathy within those organizations. And empathy really matters. And emotional mastery, emotional control and self-regulation really matters too. There's a scientist at MIT called Andrew Lowe who did a study on um, about 60 or so stock traders, right? Very high stress um, position, a very high stress role. And they discovered that those that had the greater ability to control their own emotions and not get too excited or too freaked out when something unexpected happened, they were able to deliver three to five times greater performance. These kinds of soft skills really matter, and we're starting to be able to prove the value that they can have to the bottom line. And something else, something else not often discussed, that I think is really important for children, is teaching them moral courage. The ability to declare that something that they observe is right or wrong and to explain logically, reasonably why, and to stand by their assertions. That's something we don't typically entrust to children at all, but it's going to be incredibly important in the years to come. Thankfully, machines are helping to mediate relationships between human beings themselves. Here we have a technology called Respondable by a company called Boomerang, and it can plug into your, um, your email client, for example, and ca it can help you to construct a message that is likely to be understood well by others or responded to, right? Some people like things very short and concise, I know I do. Other people like something that's very detailed, right? So machines can help us to preempt some of the differences between our personalities. And machines are starting to map our personalities very closely indeed. Today there are um, Barbie dolls that you can talk to, such as Hello Barbie, which has something like Siri inside it. And for our older relatives, there are companies like Joy for All, which is a division of Mattel, which will create this kind of $99 robot cat. And this is quite a simple robotic creature. But in the near future, these creatures will be able to understand if your elderly relative has had a fall, for example, or if they haven't left their apartment in three days. And with their consent, will be able to um, 
quietly inform you so you can go and do a little welfare check. But machines are starting to get smarter and they're starting to get ever more embedded within the home. Here we have Aristotle, which is coming out in a couple of weeks. And this is uh, also created by Mattel. And it is a sort of a smart Siri that your child can talk to. But as a parent or as a teacher, one might be concerned about what if the child has um, some sort of dark existential question or questions about the birds and the bees and things like that, that maybe you might like to have that conversation with your child yourself. So lots of questions that this raises. And furthermore, companies like Facebook have been taught doing experiments on, uh, on young people within their social networks in order to pinpoint when they are at their most emotionally vulnerable. Now, in theory, they were to do that in order to uh, intervene or to help get them some help. But you can easily see how these technologies can potentially be abused. Machines are going to be with us all of the time. Every smartphone is a portable sensor, just as is every drone and as is every autonomous vehicle, which is, of course, just a robot that you can climb inside, right? And all of them are monitoring the world all of the time. And the sensors that enable them to do this are getting more sophisticated. 3D depth sensors, for example, are now going to be coming out on your smartphones in the next year or two. And those are enabling you to now create 3D models of the world around you. And in fact, it is possible to scan an object, manipulate it in software, and then spit it out back into the world again. Might be a few years before we see this, but this is definitely where we're heading. Furthermore, these technologies enable us to understand the world in new ways. This is a company called Motion Savvy, and Motion Savvy can use these time of flight depth sensors in order to map the movements of the hands of somebody who talks in sign language. Here we see they're being mapped in 3D and turned into a message at the top. So these kinds of tools with the sensors that are going to be available on any smartphone or tablet within the next 18 months to two years are going to enable all sorts of people to communicate who otherwise couldn't, making a much more inclusive classroom for everyone. We can do more with these sensors. We can combine different spectras of information to create something called hyperspectral imaging that can enable you to, for example, look inside an avocado. And at Singularity University, we have an app for that. There's a company called Impact Vision can tell you when that avocado is going to go overripe or not. Bit of a first world problem, I admit. But we can do much more interesting things as well. The same technology can look inside the human body and find the hemoglobin in the bloodstreams. This is a technology, again, that's coming to your pocket in about two years or so. We can do more. This is a technology called Eulerian movement magnification. And it is basically amplifying tiny movements within the face, movements that are too small to perceive consciously. But by amplifying them, we can do things like watch the blood flow around the face. And from that, we can get, for example, a beats per minute, right? And it's very funny to do this on videos of politicians, because they get asked a difficult question, and you can see the BPM go way up. But a little more spooky are things like uh, the FDNA app by uh, Accessible Genetics. And this is an app that can detect or diagnose over 4,000 genetic conditions just by looking at the face of an individual. Another example is right eye. And this is an algorithm that can look at the movement of a toddler's eyes. And it can predict autism in up to 86% of cases from as young as six months of age. 
We can even go into the world of animals. This is an algorithm that can actually detect pain and distress within animals, in this case, sheep. As, as human beings, it might be difficult to tell whether a sheep is smiling or frowning, but machines can. Machines can understand things that, as human beings, some of us might find difficult. So these technologies mean that machines are able to understand us in very complex ways, drilling down into very complex um, descriptions of who we are as human beings, our characters, our values, and how those are changing over time. And machine intelligence is moving from the cloud to individual objects, right? This is sometimes called edge computing. We had cloud computing where, you know, everything was centralized in a cloud, and now it's kind of moving back again as these little tiny intelligences, very small, very powerful, are now becoming embedded in all kinds of different objects. Machines are helping us to make commercial decisions as well, right? Everything from your uh, Amazon Dash button that you can tap whenever you run out of detergent, for example, to making all kinds of recommendations about where to meet your friend for lunch. So perhaps you're gluten-free and your friend is vegetarian and you're going on your bike and your friend is going by car and machine al intelligence algorithms can very quickly figure out how to connect the dots and bring people together. And ultimately, that's what machine intelligence is really for, I believe, and what it should be used for, is helping people to, to communicate, to collaborate, to understand each other, and to understand themselves. And that's where we're going next. As machine intelligence gets more sophisticated, chatbots are enabling us to have virtual friends, in a sense, a confident that we can speak to. And in fact, there's been experiments in places like Russia where they've taken all of the chat logs between good friends uh, for years and years and years and social media posts and things like that and have used those to create a sort of virtual replica of someone who has unfortunately deceased. And that can be a way of slowly letting go. There's another bot called AI Buddy, which was created for a similar purpose, to help children of um, children who had basically lost their parents, or, or one of their parents, in order to facilitate that process until gradually the child doesn't need that crutch anymore and they can fade away. Unbelievably to some of us, you know, when we grew up, we had so many cultural tropes, especially in the West, a little bit less in the Eastern Hemisphere. But we had so many cultural tropes of the naughty robot that needed to be, you know, taken down a peg or two because it got too big for its boots and it went rogue. And in fact, we're starting to see something a little different. In fact, of the, you know, instead of the machine being something to be afraid of, those of us who really interact with machine intelligence on a daily basis can often find it's easier or more comfortable to talk to a machine than a human being, sometimes. In fact, something I really want you to take away from this is that human beings are very willing to form relationships with AI software, surprisingly. And you're all going to be surprised by how easy that seems as machines start to get more sophisticated. Already, we're interacting with machine intelligence and uh, autonomous entities much more than we today realize. In fact, only about 50% of internet traffic is human beings. The rest is bots. And it's about 50-50 nice bots, and the, the other half uh, is not so nice bots. And uh, those are things that can you know, spam you or try and trick you and that sort of thing. At the end, we'll have a little discussion on what we can do about that. But as we interact more with the good bots, certainly, we cannot help but ascribe to them 
a limited form of personhood. And I always describe personhood as something that's not an on-off switch, like somebody is a person or they're not, but rather it's a process of degrees, right? Like a dial. And for us to think of someone as a person, whether they're a human being or even an animal, uh, or whether they're an old person or an adult or a young person, or even a machine, they need to have an identity which means they're able to interact with others and they have a sense of autonomy. And they need to have integrity as well, which means they need to have some sort of reputation to them, some standing within a community, and to be able to use judgment to explain why they made a decision. You know, it's okay to sort of get up and leave a board meeting, um, but people might expect you to explain why, right? And being able to explain why you made a decision is something that's very important for machines to, to get really good at doing so. But we cannot help but look at machines and start to anthropomorphize them and think of them as little autonomous entities or as cute little children in a sense. And in fact, these uh, pack bots, which are used for bomb disposal uh, in war-torn nations, often the soldiers that work with them cannot help but become very attached to them, especially if the machine has effectively saved their life. And when Scooby, for example, uh, ends up being destroyed by an IED, they're often given funerals and sort of sent back in a kind of a casket. Strange, but true. I'd like to show you a brief video. And... For me, I find it slightly distressing to watch, even though rationally I know that there's no reason for me to be. But I cannot help it. So that's a little child's robot, right? A toy called Pleo. But when I see the robot abused and it's sort of moaning, I cannot help but feel empathy with it. And I think many of you are probably the same. And as these entities start to get more sophisticated, it's going to be incredibly difficult to let go of feeling empathy for others. And I don't think that it's something that we need to worry about too much. I think it's something that we should expect. Our species has been sat around campfires like this for about two million years, or our, our species and our further ancestors. As we've been sat around this fire, we've been telling each other stories, and we've been gossiping about other people and the things they did or didn't do and they were supposed to. Our species is driven to connect with others. And we are going to connect with machines in a very deep way, especially as they start creating narratives for us to follow and understand, or even more, understanding our own personal stories. I'd like to give you an example of the current state of the art, very best technology we have in counseling and psychotherapy with intelligent machines. My kids keep me going. What advice would you have given yourself 10 or 20 years ago? Um, to, uh, to not believe uh, to, to, to not be so gullible, to not be so gullible. Mm -hmm. So this is something called SimSense, and it was created by the US Navy uh, Office of Veteran Affairs, I believe. And you'll see that the system is capable of understanding emotion, understanding intonation of the voice, the prosody, the speed of how things are said, but also whether the Participants leaning in, leaning out, micro-expressions. But it's also able to understand the context of what is being said and to give a meaningful response and draw a little more information out of the participant or even to sort of move on to something if they appear to be distressed. You know, one of the greatest problems in our society, and in fact, the greatest killer in our society. I think it's not necessarily road accidents 
or heart disease. I think it's loneliness. Right? And what would it be like if all of us had a machine friend that we could call upon when times were tough? Or when we had some sort of really tricky existential question in our heads that gave us a shiver up the spine. Those things sometimes you Google at 2 a.m. All of us, if we're lucky, can call up our friends, but sometimes things are very personal, or sometimes it's difficult to share with a human being. But it's easier with a machine, right? There's less judgment. I believe that technology is the thing that makes scarce stuff abundant, right? And what if we had an abundance of friendships or emotional care within our society? Would we have as many spree killers or suicides or that sort of thing? I think not. And I believe that we are heading towards a much happier and healthier emotional society in the years to come, thanks to machine intelligence. But for this rather optimistic and perhaps a little rosy view of the future to arrive, we really must learn from the lessons of the past. We do not want machines that are annoying, that get in the way, that ask us silly questions or creepy questions. We don't want this. And you'll remember I said that about 25% of bots, 25% of traffic, in fact, on the web today is naughty bots that are spamming or impersonating human beings in order to do fraud of ads and clicks and that sort of stuff, right? And some of them can be very nefarious. Bots that impersonate human beings so well that they can trick us in all sorts of nasty ways and creating some sort of a passport system for autonomous systems and illustrating when something is a human or is not a human is going to become incredibly tricky in the years to come as these systems get more and more sophisticated. So where is this taking us? Boiling it down, AI is growing up and it is shaping the future of humanity like a child or like a pet that's young and a little naive at times. AI needs good influences and it needs great human role models to show it how it should be acting and how it should be interacting more preferably with human beings. There is a risk of liberty and justice being lost within deep neural nets that harbor biases within them, right? Because they're trained on the human world. And there's lots of biases and stereotypes and things that shouldn't be in that training data that can end up in there. And if we are to have machines that we can respect and rely upon, we need to teach them how to be human. There is a art come science come philosophy called computational ethics or machine ethics. And it's a process of teaching ethical and value information to intelligent machines. I am a co-founder of an organization called openeth.org. And we are creating a kind of data set of different ethical scenarios for machines to learn from and learn about human values. And we're teaching it in a similar way to how you and I learned our values as young children. A little bit of it was through reinforcement, right? Carrot and stick, uh, punishment or reward. But a lot of it, in fact, was from sitting by our grandparents' knees and being told fairy tales and sagas and fiction, right? the goodies, the baddies, the moral of the story. You see, 
Non-fiction books are for learning facts, but fiction is where we learn our values. And so we are creating a mechanism where we can teach fiction to machines. We can create little stories with more or less preferable outcomes. And we can translate that directly into something called modal logic that computers find easy to understand. And so human beings know the rules that the machines are supposed to be following. And we're bringing human values and machines together. It is my belief that the, ne the next trillion dollar economy in our society is going to be something like the kindness economy, right? In the past 20 years, we've seen the first layer of the web, and that was search, right? And Google are the chiefs of that domain. And then the second layer came along, and that was social. So things got a little more personal-oriented, right? It wasn't just client and server, it was more peer-to-peer, -peer, learning and sharing from each other. And Facebook are the chiefs of that domain as well. We're seeing a third layer emerge, which is the economic layer. And that's things like the machine-payable web, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that are enabling us to bring economics into the internet in a way that wasn't possible before, in a distributed sense. But I think there's going to be a fourth layer, and that's going to be ethics. And that's going to enable us to chart negative externalities of naughty companies that spit nasty things into the commons, or that chart good behavior or bad behavior of individuals, companies, and even AI entities. I think that's where we are really heading in the next 10 to 20 years. And I think this is the best way of instilling the best values of character within our children of the next generation. And we can do it, all of us together, when we come together and co-create this new layer of ethics, because it's not going to be top down. It's going to be all of us learning from each other. We can do it if we can create something like a human heart for machines. Thank you.